friends. So it's a beautiful summer day. I thought maybe we we get out of the uh, office over there and uh, maybe in the, the backyard and have a little conversation about the Eucharist. Have you ever doubted the belief in existence of the presence of God in the Eucharist? I know I have. I'd be surprised if anyone has in it sometime just had that that thought pass over even if it's just passing hasn't built a nest and taken root inside of us is God present to us in the Eucharist is that really Jesus yeah I've asked that question many many times I've had that feeling and, and, and that fear and, and, and definitely had moments when I doubted that what to do with that I think stories are a powerful thing. Uh, I really love stories, uh, especially true stories, you know, um, that really bring home to you a certain point. So I'm going to tell you uh, two stories. Uh, they're actually from uh, Father Mike Smith. And Father Mike Smith is one of the priests that I like to follow. I know we all have um, people in the spiritual life that we like to follow. Uh, he's one of them. So, I want to preface this by saying, if Jesus really is in the Eucharist, is the Eucharist, his real presence is there, then what should that mean for our lives? I mean, really, what should that mean? If you believe that, if I believe that, how should we be living? Okay, so, Father Mike Smith, well, he tells the story of when he was in college as a college student that he would go to the Newman Mass, meaning the, the Mass on campus that was for the college students. And it was a great Mass. And at the end of Mass, uh, there would often be this uh, guy who would be up on the floor, literally on his hands and knees, right where communion was distributed. And he'd be uh, picking things up off the floor and eating it. And Father Mike Smith and some of the others would be in the back of the church, you know, back in the gathering space, just uh, meeting one another, friendship, conversations, that kind of stuff. But he noticed this guy consistently doing it. What was going on? So they had substantial bread for the Eucharist. What does that mean? It was still leavened bread, but it wasn't the thin little wafer. It was a thicker piece of bread. And the way back then, that they distributed the substantial bread is they broke it off from loaves. And then body of Christ, body of Christ, body of Christ. But the problem was, is that as they broke off pieces of that loaf, small fragments, crumbs, would fall from the bread and sometimes fall on the ground. And so what this college student was doing at the end of Mass, was going up and searching for those crumbs and then eating those crumbs off the ground. At that time, Father Mike admits it was a bit strange seeing this, but he eventually got the courage to go up and say, what are you doing and why are you doing this? And the guy explained, you know, this is the body of Christ. Even in the crumbs, it's the body of Christ. And so I'm here to consume the body of Christ so the body of Christ is not trampled upon. And you know, by the way, too, this is the reasons why you sometimes see a priest as he's celebrating Mass uh, after he's been handling the bread, even the small little thin wafers, um, he'll, he'll do something like this over the cup, you know, but in case there are any uh, little fragments that have adhered to his skin. Um, some priests even uh, will hold their fingers together after they touch the Eucharist. And uh, they don't bring those two fingers that have held the Eucharist together uh, apart again until they've had a chance to wash their hands at the end of Mass. A variety of ways in which a priest shows uh, respect for the reality that this is the body of Christ. But that image of that guy's obviously 
stayed with Father Mike Smith for years. And here's the reason why. Not just what he did, but why he did it and, and where that came from in his own life. And so this young man, by the way, he was a college student, a football player, an athlete, popular, uh, you know, dated a lot of girls and um, just was a normal guy. And, but a normal guy who was willing to be different because of the reality of the Eucharist. And different because the Eucharist is the body of Christ. He was willing to be different. So hold on to that, right? He tells the story to Mike, again, when the two of them are in, uh, as college students. When I was 15 years old, he said, I was told a story, and it was told at Mass, and it was a story I, I, I've never forgotten. And the story is when the communists began to take over in China, and what they did to Christians in general and Catholics specifically, going into all the churches and, and burning them down, destroying them, desecrating the altars, and, and so on, and, or, in order to put out the faith so that they could control the people. So one of the stories that comes out of China during that time is a priest was in a village and um, he was the only priest in the village. And uh, it was a village that had uh, been evangelized and brought to the Lord and they were all Catholic communists come in town. And they immediately go to the Catholic church. And when they go into the church, they're intent on destroying the faith, not just of that priest, and um, destroying the church, but destroying the faith of the people. So they go into the church and they start to destroy the church. And they break all the stained glass windows. They destroy all the statues. They, they desecrate and break the um, altar. They take the Bible and they rip it up. Uh, uh, they paint all kinds of communist slogans on the inside of the church. Uh, and then they take the tabernacle. They pick it up. They don't know what it is. They pick it up and throw it through one of the stained glass windows. And it falls upon the ground right under the carport that is between um, the, uh, the rectory and uh, the church. Right? Now, before they destroyed the church, they took the priest and they put him on house. They beat him and then they put him on house arrest under guard. So the priest was not allowed to leave the house for any purpose whatsoever and not allowed to see his people. Not even allowed to step outside. So the Eucharist is thrown out uh, on the ground, and there it is, under underneath some sort of shelter or cardboard or whatever. The, 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 the soldiers go on from that day, and they are told by their superiors to check in every day to make sure that you know that everything is being controlled. But they left a group of guards, one or two guards guarding the priest so he could not get out. A little girl sees all this. A, a little 12-year-old sees the desecration and the destruction of the church. In the cover of night, she comes back. And she comes to the Eucharist on the ground. And she kneels down because that's what she's taught. She's been taught this is God, you know. In, in sacramental form, uh, in a way that we as humans can't see and discern with our brains, but detect with our senses. But God, nevertheless, the God who can do anything, including becoming bread and us not seeing the change, the, the, the existential change. This little girl, she didn't understand all that. She knows that this is the body of Christ. And so she puts herself at risk to come down and to receive the Eucharist. But she's also taught in that day, in that age, not to receive uh, the Eucharist by any other form. And at that time, you couldn't receive on the hand, you could only receive on, on the tongue. So she would literally come down and, and bend all the way to the ground, and she would uh, take one host upon her tongue. And she was also taught that you could only receive the Eucharist once a day. Back then, um, that was the rule. Uh, you know, now if you've gone to Mass uh, and gone to the whole Mass you know, twice a day, three times a day, you can still receive the Eucharist, but not then. 
And so she received every night. She would come back in the darkness of the night, dodging the guards, not being seen by them, and receive one Eucharist every night in order to receive the Eucharist, but also to protect the Eucharist. That was the way in her 12-year-old mind that she came up with, rather than scoop them all up, because she was taught that she couldn't touch the Eucharist. The last night she comes. So the last night she comes, and she does the same thing, bends down to receive the last host upon her tongue. She receives the last host upon her tongue. And as she's giving up to leave, she runs into something. She steps on a piece of glass, whatever. The guards that are there see her and see what she's done with all the host, and they immediately come and beat her to death. Beat the back of her. All the while, her, this little 12 year old girl's response to the Eucharist answers the question for us, doesn't it? That if this is the real presence of God, that this is Jesus in the Eucharist, if the Eucharist is Jesus, what should we be doing with our lives? We should be living our lives as if this is the Lord, because it is the Lord. Respect for the Eucharist, the way we approach the Eucharist, the way we receive our Lord in the Eucharist, and the way Here's very important. The way that we allow the Eucharist to affect our lives, to change our lives, the courage it should give us, the strength it should give us, the devotion it should give us, the love it should give us, the, the relationship that we should have because we're able to have God dwell in us. You know, we just come out of a period, and some are still in it because of you know, health problems or, or frailties of old age. We just come out of a period where you and I were not able to have access to the Eucharist. And I talked to so many of our Christians during that quarantine period. And over and over again, the majority of them, the majority of them said how they desperately missed receiving our Lord in the Eucharist among everything that was going on in their lives, that was the thing that they missed the most, was receiving our Lord. Beautiful, right? That, that they understood that this is the presence of God, and they were not able to receive it. And then when we came back into the church, for those who have been able to come back, so many of them have said to me during this time, of just how much it meant for them to be able to receive our Lord again in the universe. And I saw many tears in the first couple of weeks that we were back of people uh, coming up to as as I, I came to them in the pews and gave them the Eucharist. I saw tears running down their face. They get it. They get what's going on. Here's something I want to leave you with. So during this quarantine period, there are some people that are not able to receive the Eucharist. We've already talked to everybody in the parish and, uh, you know, for a variety of ways, like through flock notes and letters and, and um, through neighbors and fellow Christians, and let them know that if they're not able to get back to Mass yet, first of all, we have the live stream which doesn't replace the Mass. I mean, it isn't, you know, we're not there when I would receive the Eucharist, but it, 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 it's the best that we can offer right now. And many people have really, really appreciated that, being able to participate with the rest of the community in the worship of our God. But it doesn't replace the Eucharist. They know it, I know it, you know it. And so here's what I want to suggest, a couple of things. If you know of people who are, still homebound, reach out to them. First of all, just in love and concern for their life, uh, like a buddy, and, and, and make sure they're doing all right. We have a lot of our Christians already doing that. But you know people specifically. They're in your neighborhood. They're, they're fellow Christians, they're family members, whatever. Reach out to them. 
and remind them, yes, about the, the live stream mass. But, and then if they don't have that, help set that up for them or point them to the TV mass, you know, like the one that the bishop does every week. That's the first part. The second part is this. Bring them the Eucharist. You be the one to choose to bring them the Eucharist. You just contact me. You contact our parish office. We'll give you the training. We'll commission you to be a Eucharist minister. You're coming to Mass. At the end of each Mass, uh, Eucharist ministers come up and receive um, hosts that they're going to go and bring the Eucharist to other people. So you do that, right? I mean, think about it for a second. You, because of your health and the, your life right now, are actually able to have access into the Eucharist in a way uh, and able to have access in, 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 to God on this good earth in a way that no other experience of life can come near to. But they're not. But they can with your help. So contact us at the parish office and, um, and, and we'll give you the training and the commissioning and uh, uh, picks a little container that holds it. We'll, we'll teach you how to bring Eucharist to him. We'll bring you the prayers and, and do that in a way that's safe for them, like going out on the porch and uh, praying at a distance with them. We'll take you through all the protocols that will keep you and them safe. Do that, right? Here's the third thing. The third thing is, is this, as uh, there have been some people who haven't been able to make it back to Mass, there's also people who have been not been able to make it back to Eucharistic Adoration. And remember, we have Eucharistic Adoration seven days a week here at St. Francis. There are several people, I've been told, uh, who, because they're not able to come to Eucharistic Adoration, there are uh, one-hour slots that are not filled up. And it's uh, been a struggle for us. It's been a challenge for us to, is to make the Eucharist available to our parishioners to be able to worship. Um, you take those times, right? I mean, what can you be doing that's better use of your time than one hour a week? Yeah, better use of your time. One hour a week, right? To be placing yourself in front of the Eucharist that that young college student got on his knees in order to make sure that every crumb, every particle of the body of Christ was able to be consumed and not trampled on. Well, that young that 12-year-old Chinese girl uh, faced with, um, with terrible um, uh, consequences that she knew that she was taking by being able to receive our Lord secretly in the universe every day for herself and to protect the universe. We're free right now to be in this land, to be able to worship our Lord in the Eucharist and have access to Him. Fill those one-hour slots. And not just for the sake of those one-hour slots being filled, but for the sake of those one hour slots be filled by you. You need our Lord. I need our Lord. I'm blessed. I have the Eucharist uh, in a chapel in my rectory, and I get to spend adoration every morning in prayer before our Lord. What a blessing that is. When we do this, when we make these sacrifices, I can't even believe I'm using that word, right? When we make these sacrifices of our precious time in order to place ourselves before the Lord in the universe. What? So that we can worship Him, so we can adore Him, so we can love Him, so He can give us love, so He can give us peace, so He can give direction to our lives, so that He can heal us, so that He can make us whole, so that He can make us become the persons, help us become the persons that we're always meant to be. He will give us you so much more than you will give of yourself to Him. When you make the sacrifice, of that one hour to be with him. He will change your life. And then that you'll become a person who will change the lives of so many other people that you haven't been able to do on your own. But him dwelling in you as you receive the Eucharist and him who you place yourself before and remind yourself week after week, he's the Lord. 
He's the master. He's my mother. Lover. He's my spouse. He's father. He's the most important person in my life. And then living that life, your life like that, you will want to share him with others. And you will indeed, in fact, share him with others. And then the thing that you want for your loved ones the most, to be close to God, God will change your life and form and shape your life and equip your life to be the means by which others draw closer to him. And then everything that you want for them, such as their happiness, they'll be able to find because you find it in Christ and share it freely with others. That's what one hour in adoration can do. So you'll see on the screen the number and the name of our Eucharistic Adoration Coordinator, Julie Metzler. All you have to do is just reach out to her and find out what those hours are, or even sign up for an hour that's more convenient for you. And let's uh, go from uh, however many doors we have now, a couple hundred, to three or four hundred, five hundred doors. I mean, shouldn't our church be filled with Christians who get with that college student camp guy who understood it? And what a, a 12 year old a girl from China understood, shouldn't we understand this as mature as we are in our spiritual life and as many years that we've had access to our Lord and Eucharist? Shouldn't we get him? So let's go get him. Let's go. Let's go get him. And let him get us. And send us out to get a whole lot. Till next time, friends.